Good morning. Uh, looks like my music app crashed. Why? That's what I get for trying to use iTunes on a Windows machine. Hmm. Maybe iTunes isn't going to work. There we go. That'll work. Okay. It's plan B. Nikhil, that many like because I have to sell a kidney to afford them? What? It's not that many. Unless I have the description messed up. What does it say? Oh, no, yeah, that's right. Actually, I'm not doing one of the 50s. When I was pulling all the lenses for the stream today, uh, I noticed one of them... Which one is in here? I think it's the 1.4. Yeah, the 50 1.4. Um, the focus sleeve is just completely disengaged, so I'm not doing that one today. So it's actually only four lenses, technically. Good morning, Cameron. Okay. Let's get my apps all running here. Oh, there's iTunes. Uh, I'm going to see if iTunes works. If not, then I'll switch back to the browser one. Okay. I think that should be good. We'll bring it up a tiny bit and hopefully iTunes doesn't crash again. All right, jumping in. First one I'm going to do is the 24. Is this the 24? Can't even tell. No, it's the 28. That's the 24. Must be right. Yeah. There we go. Up to date. Um. Um. 
Mr. Rajput mentioned the price of these. Uh, but I've actually seen Leica R prices going down just a tad, which is kind of nice. But I also have to assume that part of that is because the supply is sort of drying up, so all that's left is the not-so-great copies. Everything else has been modified. I mean, we've... I can't even... I wish I had kept track of Leica R specifically from, like, the day we started doing our mods for the city mod. Um, I mean, we track the mods in general, but I, I haven't... There's no way to determine how many of those are Leica R specifically. But it's gotta be... I mean, I would have to assume that the majority of Leica R's that are out there have been modified by us, by Duclos. Okay. Oh my gosh, Antonio, they've not arrived. That's crazy. Twentieth of September. Wow. I wonder if we call FedEx if that would help, or if that's just gonna complicate things. Um, let me before I jump into this lens. I'm actually gonna drop a message to our logistics people. It was Mala Films, right? Don't call, okay? <laughs> if you want us to, let me know, and I'll tell our logistics guy to to dig into it. That's crazy, though. It, they've been just sitting there. All right. So speaking of quality, ooh. I mean, nice crisp click stop, so that's for sure, but very dry. Um, the mount on this one's in fantastic condition. Barely used, if anything. It's got a little bit of wear, wear and tear on the plastic baffle. A little bit of road rash there. Little, little tiny dings here and there, nothing crazy. Uh, the paint is a little bit yellowed. Focus is okay. Not perfect. There's a little bit of lost motion. I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, you hear it more with the actual focus. Glass is fantastic, though. Not a single blemish on the front or rear. So, this should make for a wonderful Cinemod. Ah. These screws are very loose. No Loctite. Yeah, all six of these came out instantly which is a little concerning.
So, just as I thought, it's it's gummy, but it's very dried up. There's no um, there's no blobs of grease anywhere. It's just dry. I suspect it's the same um, under the iris ring. You could probably hear it. It's just raspy. Not a bad thing. There's a couple gobs, but for the most part, yeah, it's just dry. So. Some nice new high quality lubrication will do this lens some some good. Yeah, that's that's pretty nasty stuff. Okay. some wear patterns into the anodizing here. Probably from not having enough or not having new enough lubrication. Can Leica R lenses be adapted to AIS? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand your question. You mean Nikon F mount or AIS, like uh, the coupling between the camera and the lens? The metering, I suppose, I should say. Nikon F mount. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, we do stock, uh, it's a Litax product, but it's like a R2 Nikon F mount. Metering, so Nikon camera bodies, modern Nikon bodies, don't rely on communication at all to perform their metering. Um, it just looks at the sensor. So you could put any lens on a Nikon camera body and it will still meter just fine. On the FM, mm, I don't know. I don't know if that's possible. It'll mount fine, I don't know if you'll have metering. Actually, yes, you, you will still have metering, as far as I know, but you won't have, uh, you, you couldn't use shutter priority or a program or any of those. You could still use aperture priority. But yes, I believe it will still meter. The mount is 150, if that's what you're asking. Which includes installation. If you're in manual mode, then yeah, I'm pretty sure it'll still give you that, that meter through the viewfinder. But I haven't tried. Um, in fact, I'll probably... I don't have an FM. I use my go-to Nikon body, which I haven't used in a while. I feel bad, actually, but I've been using my Zeiss Icon with M-mount lenses as of late. And uh, 
my Nikon body is just sitting there, which is reminding me that I need to put some film through it. Actually, it might still have a roll in it. Um, I cannot remember the model. Wow. I bought it in Japan like three or four years ago. It was in absolute mint condition. On Christmas. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was a newer body from like the late 90s. It wasn't, it's not like a, a classic. I'm completely spacing on it. Now I want to Google it. <laughs> It's just going to bother me now. Uh, does Nikon still even make a proper film body? It does have autofocus for sure. It's not an F6. No, it wasn't. It's not that new. I mean, none of these images that came up in my search are F100, maybe. Actually, it could be an F100. Um, I got it at what I think is a steal because uh, when I was looking at it, the guy, the, the shop that was selling it in 90. Mm, that, um, it was missing the battery door on the bottom. And it, otherwise, it was perfect. You know what? Actually, it might be. Um, and so I said, well, can it still accept a battery grip? And he said, yeah, no problem, because there's no battery door. So I said, okay, well, then can you throw a battery grip in for free? And they said, sure. <laughs> I'll take a picture of it. I'll post it on Instagram. Um, so you guys can see what it is. I, for the life of me, can't remember. So anyways, he threw in the battery grip for free. Um, which is awesome, because I probably would have bought the battery grip anyway and would have removed the battery door anyway. Anyways, I'll, I'll figure it out, but yeah, I love the camera. It's, 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 uh, you know, if I want that super discreet, um, lightweight film uh, experience, then I go for my Zeiss Icon every time. But if I'm doing, like, if I'm at some sort of family thing, which I mean, we don't do much these days because of COVID, but uh, then that Nikon body is ideal because it's autofocus, the metering's perfect. Um, you don't have to cock it at all. It's, it's just reliable. It's a workhorse. Whereas the Icon, you've got to you got to really pay attention, focus on that thing, because it's a rangefinder. It's tricky at best. Um, but yeah, that Nikon is fantastic. And I don't get too fancy with it. For the most part, I either have a Zeiss ZF2 Classic on it, or just a plain old uh, Nifty 50 Nikon 518. F100. Careful with the film tour. 
Hey, hey Timmer. Is this your first time joining? Wow. I started doing these when LA went into lockdown and just kept doing it. <laughs> very jealous of your sushi the other day. Yeah, we definitely need to. I ended up ordering curbside from that place um, for Aubrey's birthday. <laughs> And it was, uh, it was interesting. It wasn't the same experience, obviously. But the food was still fantastic. I saw the picture you sent, but that's about it. Um, that's encouraging. I think that might be that might be a, a good enough setup that we're comfortable doing that. We haven't gone to any restaurants since this whole thing started. Not like um, dining in, so I think that might have to be our our first uh, first experience dining in. That was one of our last meals before the lockdown in LA. We went out for, uh, what was, oh, it was for our anniversary. That was in March, March 3rd. And then like the next week or two weeks, LA locked down, so. <laughs> Why get the first reservation? Oh, because, okay. So just go early. I just wanted to support them, even if the food was mediocre or whatever. Like, I just want to make sure that they survive the pandemic. That, that, Sushi spot cannot be a, a victim of the economy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they must survive at all costs. I agree. I, it's not cheap, that's for sure, but it's completely worth it. Yes, this is the grease for um, when I started this lens, when I opened it earlier in the stream, there was practically no grease in this.
Speaking of the new agent, Timor, what's uh, what's work looking like right now for the DP? I always try to keep up with how the industry is progressing as far as recovery goes. Ah. That's good to know. But any projects? DoorDash, nice. And are those local? I don't like it. <laughs> so it's a means to an end. Okay. Make some brother's money. We all need to keep that brother's money rolling in. It's a good metric. As long as I make enough to have an occasional meal at brother's, I'm good. This is still super noisy. Hear that? Even with fresh grease. That's concerning. Stubborn, yeah, you gotta pay the bills. It's not really coming from the the movement inside because that's nice and quiet. Where is all that noise coming from? We definitely have those. We call them the persuaders. If the part's not moving the way we want, and give it a little bit of persuasion. It's usually rawhide. You know, you don't want to scratch up the anodizing. better. So top tip, most people that aren't super experienced would, would hear this noise and they would put grease on something like this surface right here. 
which would be devastating. That would inevitably end up with oil on your aperture blades. So, be careful. <laughs> I think this is acceptable now. It's pretty good. Why is oil on the blades so bad? Um, because it makes them stick to each other and then they buckle and they can snap. Or they can either kink the actual plate, the actual blade, um, and if they kink, they bind, and then when they bind, they could snap the pins off. That's pretty good. Much better. Not super happy with that movement still. I think we're gonna dive a little deeper. Adam, yes, this, this particular lens has been cared for well, but we do see plenty that are just absolutely trashed, which is sad. Okay. 
It's a little sad to see them converted to EF. Why? Why is that sad? It's like, uh... Think of it like putting a vinyl wrap on a car. You're not changing the paint underneath. You're just giving it a little coat on top. This lens has been serviced before though, you could see right here. Someone scribed some marks right here. Yeah, it's hard to see with the reflection. There you go. That's definitely a, a service, like a technician thing. It's a bias. Oh. I agree, I'd love to see these converted to PL. It's just not that easy. PL is not possible with this body. It requires a full rehousing. I agree, it's worth it for the Leica R's, for the right person. Um, I am very aware that the the price to convert these to PL is not worth it for some people. For a lot of people, but just the Cinemod is plenty. But it completely depends on what your goals are as far as uh, mechanics go. And your camera as well. Yeah, I wouldn't want to put a Preston on one of these. At least not at full torque. These were never designed to take that kind of abuse. My first R lens is coming in the mail next week. 35 Sumercon, nice. That's a fantastic place to start. Um, I saw the article, um, I did not read it all, <laughs> typical, I read the headline. Um, yeah, I mean, PL is outdated as far as designs go, but it still works very, very well. <clears throat> the reason I think that PL is going to stick around for a while, I, I don't disagree with them, I think eventually it will phase out. Um, but the reason that I think it's going to be around for a pretty, pretty long time, you know, it's not going to go away tomorrow, is the fact that we're in this, this boom of vintage lenses, and there's so many vintage PL mount lenses that everybody wants to use, it just doesn't make sense to convert them to something else. So, 
uh, as long as the vintage fad is going on and people want those old PL lenses, it's not going to go away. No way. I agree with Jared, and I didn't read the article, but I have talked to him several times before about a new mount standard. Um, him and several other people I read have been trying to get some new system to take hold, but uh, LPL is not that system, I'll tell you that right now. LPL is useless. Have the choice for a dance film between Leica R and Red Zoom. Oh, no contest. I mean, if you want the character, Klaus, definitely go with the Leica R. That Red 1750s, it's fine. It's a great zoom. It's a great range for the price and the size. Um, but you're not going to get the the image quality, the character that you would out of the Leica Rs. I did not read what he proposed as a replacement. I could see a micro four thirds depth PL flange mount. It's not, it's not possible. The pilot diameter on the PL mount alone is bigger than micro four thirds as a whole. So that raspy feel, I think, was a result of this surface. I can see some scoring into the aluminum, which means at some point either a, a flake of brass chipped off or something, uh, you know, a piece of sand or something got in here and scratched up that inner diameter. Take down any high spots here. He did not propose, he said that the new cannon mount would in the long run take over. Mm. I mean, of course he's going to say that because that's what they put on their Komodo. Uh, I feel like he's got skin in the game now that Red is investing in RF mount. But RF mount is definitely not a robust enough solution for motion picture work. It has potential to be, but as it is right now, it's not, especially on Komodo. And the issue is the same with pretty much all bayonet style mounts. So EF, um, even Leica R, Nikon, E-mount, any of those bayonet style mounts suffer from the exact same problem. Uh, which is the, the axial play, and I'll show you that in a second. So the issue with all of those mounts, um, this is an okay example. 
So when you put your lens into your camera body, well, it's just that we're less confusing. Here, let's say this right here. So you stick your lens in here, right? You put it in, and then you twist, and it locks. The locking mechanism is this pin right here. That's the only thing that re that retains the lens and prevents it from rotating out of the mount. And this pin on every bayonet style camera. Hear that? They have wobble to them, always. It's inevitable. Because it's a spring-loaded, loose pin. It has to be free-moving. So, until you eliminate that pin as the... There's a good example. It's, you know, it's just a cap, but... Let's just pretend that this is a lens. The pin falls into that slot. And you have that on every single bayonet style mount. It's inevitable. The only way to prevent that, I've seen it done two ways to, to stop that from happening. Um, Red's, Red and Canon have their positive lock um, that once you mount it in there, the pin is fixed, but once you mount it in, you rotate a secondary ring that grabs the mount flanges, the tabs, and pulls it into the camera body. That would solve that problem easily. The second solution I've seen is what Sigma did with their MC21 adapter where you mount it and it has that wobble, fine. But then there's a screw. This doesn't have it, but there's a screw like somewhere in this diameter that you tighten and it locks it into the actual camera mount and prevents any wobble, prevents any difference in flange depth. Uh, that would be a fantastic solution, but we can't do that on lenses because you can't put a screw through the front of a lens. So, that would be the only solution, in my opinion. Yeah, you guys get my like R set on Monday for a rush gear job. Also, my first like R set. All right. How rush? Coming in on Monday, so you want it Monday afternoon? <laughs> I feel like every... Every single job these days is a rush job. Everyone sends stuff in and they say, well, I need it, I need it back ASAP. So, well, what's ASAP? So Micro Four Thirds focal distance with PL style and size diameter flange. No Bayo, shallow depth, wide mount. That concept could work, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the PL mount itself. But yes, you could what you're describing is basically what I just said. It's a positive locking bayonet style mount. Uh, this needs a slightly different grease. Quoted Jared, he said the RF lenses would take over the Canon. Oh, I agree entirely. Canon has already basically said they're not going to continue making EF mount lenses. They're not going to continue developing EF mount lenses. Everything moving forward is going to be RF. I do have a Komodo. I have shot tests, but no, I'm not. I'm not a cinematographer. I don't. I don't do. Uh, projects so everything that I shoot is basically a lens test for the most part I have that Komodo as a test plat <clears throat> test platform basically every 
camera system that we make accessories for lenses for, uh, we have to have a test platform to make sure our products work correctly. It's kind of like if a, a aftermarket car accessory manufacturer, you know, like, like floor mats, if you're making car floor mats, you have to have the car that you're making the floor mats for. You have to be able to test it and get measurements. Um, otherwise you just never know if it's going to work. So for the most part, it's a test platform. But yes, I do. I have, I have been enjoying it. In fact, one of the main products that we got it for was this little guy over here. The Fuji MK. So that's the RF mount conversion and the only proper way to check it is to put it on a Komodo or a EOS R but I didn't want to bother testing on a EOS R so we just got the Komodo so this cap is finicky but that's a fantastic combination that 18 to 55 Fujinon on the Komodo is, uh, it's like, I don't want to use any other zoom on that camera body. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, that fell right into place, which is promising. Yeah, we've been testing other lenses. Um, the other lens that I really like is the DZO Pictor zooms, especially. It sounds so so shallow, but the white um, the white painted Pictor zooms on the Stormtrooper Komodo just looks awesome. But those Pictor zooms are about twice the weight of that MK and you need to use an adapter. So it gets much, much longer, much heavier. That MK is just such a dream on that, on that camera specifically. It's much better. I can barely hear that raspiness. And it feels fantastic now, so I'm good. I am leaving that. Yeah, that feels great. How would the MKR complement a camera like C Sony? Fantastically. Again, same concept. Super small, super compact, native RF mount. You don't need to use adapters. It's a Super 35 camera, so it should cover just fine. Compared to using a Canon Speed Booster and some other type. See, that's the Speed Booster thing is great. Um, you know, if you have like, I mean, you, know, you name it, any full frame zoom with the Speed Booster on the C70, um, it's fine, but you're adding a lot of leverage because you've got to move it away an inch and a half. Take some breakfast. All right, Timur. Tell B I said hi.
I was actually a little torn when I saw the C70 announcement. I thought that would be a good test platform since it's it's Canon's mount. So if anyone's going to make the RF mount correctly, it's Canon themselves. There's always that chance that uh, that Red isn't manufacturing their RF mount to the same spec as Canon. <coughs> so. Does Duclos saw the MKMR modded with metric focus rings? Um, they actually come with both marks on them. So, uh, on all of the MK lenses, this witness here is feet, and this witness is metric. So, you're good, both ways. So yes, <laughs> we do make it with the uh, RF mount in metric. In fact, they are on the site right now. I think they just became available. You know, they just left the pre-order phase. Now you can just purchase it outright. Okay, this one... I think they're supposed to get EF mounts, but I don't have them here right now. So this is going to go back to our mount. It really is, Antonio. It's a, I mean, optically, they're up there with every other high-end zoom lens. Yeah, if you, in fact, if anybody wants to uh, be the guinea pig on the C70, I would probably extend a small discount on the MKRs. Because I haven't, I mean, this will be the first uh, cinema camera from Canon that has the RF mount. But yeah, as far as, like I said, there's really no comparison. I'll, I won't dive too deep here, but. That's your entire setup right there. You can't get smaller than that. Even if you went with something like, um, like a Canon 17 to 35, maybe you'll just shave a little bit of length, but it's still going to be the same weight, and you have a much shorter zoom range. So I don't mean to sound like a, a Fuji fanboy here, but uh, this lens, there's no way that Fujinon knew that this camera was going to exist three years ago when they released the MKs, but this is such a perfect lens for this particular camera. You know, having that, like if I was a doc guy or travel cinematography, like anything that requires mobility, <clears throat> you could throw your entire camera package in a backpack, no problem. So, this is coming with me a lot of places. <clears throat> More coffee. Okay. Yeah, this iris feels so much better now. I'm glad I dove in there a little deeper.
That didn't work. Delete a message. Remove. Haha, -ha, look at that. One down. series is the Sumolux 50. I have a V1 with what we call, what we can call some bloom. <laughs> um, the 50 that I'm doing, I believe, I don't know. I have to cross check the serial number. So this one's the opposite of the previous one. The iris is barely clicky like the, the stops are clearly defined but it's it's not a tactile they're barely there still not much use at least not you know swapping back and forth so what i can assume is that somebody left this lens on their camera and used it frequently focus feels fantastic though now let's update what is this f2 28 okay all right Diving in.
Basically, these screws, these mount screws are much tighter, and they can, uh, they definitely have thread locker on them compared to the previous one. In that article with Jared, he mentioned that he has a set of the original red primes with just the lens cells. They're very, ha! <laughs> oh, it's funny that he mentioned that. Um, yes, <laughs> they were very, very small, and the the way it went down, same specs, same speed, same coverage, everything, um, and when Jer when Jim, this was back when Jim was in charge, um, when Jim got the first prototypes, he said, no, 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 they need to be big and heavy like Master Primes, that's how people will know that they're professional. So, back to the drawing board. Yeah, this one's very gunked up. Um, <laughs> I do have photos. Um, so, I've kept quiet about it for a very long time, and I don't know where we stand legally, but we were, Duclos was involved in the original red lenses. So I do have photos, but I don't know that I should share them. Would it be possible to make mine like that? What do you mean? Your existing red primes? No, completely different optical design. The glass was half the size of what ended up going into them. But yes, those originals, the ones that he mentioned, I'm gonna have to read the article to see how much he's divulging, because if he is giving up information, then I can kind of give it up easier. But the original prototypes that we built were very, very small, very lightweight. Still a T18 or 19, I can't remember. Um, same coverage. They were not T15.
at the original prototypes that we built were about the same size as a Zeiss Super Speed. Which I personally think was impressive, but at the time, quality meant big and heavy and uh, in retrospect, I think that most people would agree that the size and weight of a lens is not indicative of its quality. And the same goes for a camera. <laughs> Just because Aerie has a giant, heavy, big camera, you know, back when, like, the epics were coming out, doesn't mean it's better. It means it's bigger and heavier. What was that? That early one, the D21, I think. Oh, this is very marred, chewed up. Oh yeah, I don't know if that will show up at all, but you can see chunks of aluminum that have flaked off. That's not good. D20 and D21. Put them on the Komodo. That's hilarious. The Komodo is quite literally half the size and maybe a third the weight of a Red Prime. Which I keep finding hilarious that that's the point that we're at. You know, I I, I power this Komodo with an Anton Bauer battery. And the battery is the same size as the camera. It's insane. I don't know if that says more about how much progress we've made with cameras technology or how little progress we've made with battery technology. Hello, Kevin. You've come to the right place for lens zen. Ah, Phil. We were just talking about Komodo stuff. Your ears must have been burning. Good morning. Very little progress with battery tech for sure. I watched um, Tesla's battery day presentation, which was not revolutionary by any means, but um, definitely a step in the progress direction as far as battery technology goes. Not so much for, for this sort of stuff because battery, the cells are gonna be not much different. I think they're, I think they're slightly shorter, but wider. Yeah, Kevin, I completely agree. You're not, um, you know, you have like, you have Moore's law with electronics and, and transistors, but then with physics and, um, more strict laws you have like Snell's law and things that are a little more difficult to overcome I mean I love that little Anton Bauer battery but it's still 
Where is that thing? It's pretty much the size of the Komodo. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But yeah, this little thing, I love it because it's got the D-tap, it's got the USB, I can run pretty much everything off of it. And it's super low on right. It's like 26% right now, I need to charge this guy. The only thing I wish is for there to be a different charging input other than just the V-mount. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I almost wish that you could plug this into like even just micro USB, like a trickle charge. But yeah. I do need to get, oh, since you're here, Phil, where's the best place to get these, these Canon batteries? You can charge through D-tap? What? You mean on this D-tap, I can, this is power in as well? No way. I had no idea. <laughs> wow. So I could just get... Oh man, that's game changing. Well, I know you could chain them because they're... You're, you're outputting. I didn't... I had no idea that it was an input as well. It's slow as hell. I'm okay with that. I don't care if it takes overnight to charge it. The reason I want that is because I keep a, a, a big Yeti battery that's strictly charged from a solar panel on my roof. Um, and it's nice just to be able to charge all of my uh, little power banks and whatnot strictly off solar, not off my house. So you need to have like a, a Amazon affiliate store or something with all this stuff. Or maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> if you do, drop a, a link. So that I can tell this this has been modified after it was built. There's some um, someone filed down this slot. Um, you've got this deep scoring right here, and even more right here. I don't think that's going to show up. Uh, yeah, you can see it. There you go. Right here, it's pretty bad. That's gonna be a challenge to get to feel good. But challenge accepted.
A buddy of mine is putting together a Lego R set this week. This coming week, we'll be sending them over for mod. Nice. I will be glad to help your buddy. Is this somebody that I know? Adam is all about that 60 macro. <laughs> Biggest takeaway from that article that you guys were mentioning earlier with um, with Jared, the cover of FT Times had that had the photo labeled Jared Land President or whatever photo by Brad Pitt, <laughs> which I thought was clever.
Canon BPs, by the way, are real hard to find right now. I know. More coming. I wonder if I could make some calls to Canon to get some of those batteries. Is that the battery that the C70 will run on as well? Interesting. So what is that? Whoops, wrong. So the, what is the most common camera those BPs are used in? Hello, Luca. Welcome. OGC3. Ah, oh, it's that battery? Why did I not know that? I might have those then. I've got a ton of C300 batteries. Is it these? Have I had them this whole time and I didn't even know it? Oh, that's nasty. Oh my god, I've been using that D-tap thing the whole time. Oh, I should get rid of that. It says BP nine 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 five five. Oh. Oh. And they're both full. Yep. I had no idea. Look at that. So in theory I could hawk these at a profit. Very cool. So if I just, I can hot swap them, right? I can just pull it off and I still have power. <gasps> Look at that. That's so cool. I love this little camera. Let 
go set that right there. Although that just doubled the weight of the whole thing. <laughs> I love how he invites us all to ruin his production. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's Saturday. I, you know, I, uh, the the vast bulk of our Cinemods happen throughout the week. Saturday is just, just catching up on stuff that I didn't get to do. more than enough for what I do. I'm not I'm not shooting actual projects, so speaking of being a guinea pig for MKR for the C70, how would I get in touch with you for that? You would email me, Matthew at duclosselenses.com. do have one of the chunky um, BP batteries as well, the one that sticks straight out the back of the C300. So that would probably run almost double, I would assume. Uh-oh. Clogged. I do love the smell of Loctite thread locker. Brings back memories. It's like my childhood. Some people remember the smell of like the park or the pies or whatever. For me, it's thread locker. Thread locker and uh, cutting oil and aluminum. Hello, Javid. Welcome back. sit there for an hour while it soaks in. In the meantime, uh, can you use plenty?
It's almost time for more coffee. This lock ring is going to have to get repainted. Just realized I was probably covering that the whole time with my hat. I apologize. I keep forgetting that I moved this camera much farther back, so I have to be careful about that.
My Matthew, hope you're doing well. How did you like the Clavius lenses from Richard Kale? And the lens testing for your comment is misplaced and it shows the same as for the Sigma Classics. Uh, are you referring to the... Excuse me. Um, are you referring to the share grid lens test? know that I gave feedback on those. Um, at least not written. Um, but I do recall testing them. Uh, they're unique. They are far, far from perfect. But that's kind of the idea. Uh, as far as the character goes, it was intense um, it's it's definitely something that if you're using those lenses you really have to be committed to having a look um, there there's no there's no middle ground with those lenses it's all or nothing mechanically they're they're okay. They're very complexly engineered, but I understand why he did what he did as far as the construction goes. Um, yeah, I, I think they're they're okay lenses, but they're definitely for a specific look that you have to be committed to. Five one four. What's this? Two thirty five F two. Okay. Um, before I dive into this one, though, I'm gonna refresh the coffee. Actually, it's still okay. That's the one I want. <laughs> this is a fantastic lens. Ooh. There's definitely a piece of sand in there. But it's intermittent. Doesn't show up every time. That's the kind of thing that terrifies me because we can do all this work, ship it back to the customer, and then that little piece of sand can start showing up. And of course, they're gonna say, oh, it wasn't there before. And then all of a sudden, we're responsible for it. I don't feel it at all now, though. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Iris feels good. Glass looks good. Body looks great. Almost no signs of abuse. A little tiny, tiny road rash right there. What's a fair rate on these? That I couldn't tell you. Um, anytime somebody asks me about the value of Leica R's, um, I go to eBay, I look up the lens, and then I go to completed, or I go to sold listings, and look at what they're going for. 
uh, because it can fluctuate so much, even day to day. Uh, if someone's got a full set and they just need that one lens to complete a set, then obviously they're willing to pay more than a guy that maybe is just starting out and is going to pay bare minimum. Is this the same lens that we find in the Summicron C? No, these are completely, completely different from Summicron C's. Not even the same factory, not even the same continent. Prices are all over the place. It, the prices are everywhere because the conditions are all over the place as well. You can find one that is abused and in relatively poor condition, and the price is going to be pretty good. Uh, and then you can find new, you know, mint in box, whatever, uh, that's going to be very high priced. Um, just be very careful if you're actually buying on eBay. Uh, I have never seen a listing that said mint or near mint and actually been accurate. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a crapshoot on eBay. Pretty clean. This might be the the least abused one so far today. Definitely has a, a good amount of grease, but it's not it's not like a factory grease, which tells me that this lens has been serviced uh, relatively recently. Yeah, this should feel really nice once we're done.
is this one for a customer? All of the lenses on the mod stream is for are for clients, customers. I do not own. I, I own like three or four like ours that are mine, but um, we don't we don't sell used lenses. We only sell new lenses from authorized manufacturers. Um, so like nothing gray market or anything like that. But any lens that I'm doing on the mod stream belongs to someone else, not me or not do close lenses. That is my Komodo we were talking about earlier. Bam. We were having a, uh, I was having a, a revelation moment thanks to Phil about the batteries that I did not realize I even had. Just got here. Well, then, welcome to my Saturday mod stream. Am I modding the zoom in the corner? Uh, yes and no. Technically, it's already modded. That's a Fuji MK zoom that was converted from E mount to Canon RF mount specifically for the Komodo. I am not modding it today, it has already been modded.
the DZO zooms are surprisingly good for the price. Um, I was, that's why I had this out here earlier. I was talking about the MK zoom specifically on Komodo and how it's probably my favorite pairing. Um, oh, I did not clean this. Uh, the DZO zooms are fantastic, but specific to Komodo, they're about twice the weight of the Fuji MKs. So I think they're fantastic on larger cameras. I don't think their size and weight does them justice on something like Komodo because you still have to use an adapter as well. So that said, they are probably the best value you can get in a cine zoom. clarify though that does not mean that they're gonna perform um, like other lenses that are more expensive you know they're not, they're not gonna have the image quality of the Fujinon MK or even close to something like a Permista um, but like I said at that price it's kind of hard to beat them How does the Laua Oom stand against that set in terms of image quality? Um, that's a good comparison. The DZO zooms are going to perform slightly better optically and mechanically. Uh, what you lose in image quality with the Laua, you make up for in zoom range. So that's kind of that that balance, that compromise you have to make. So because the DZO zooms are a shorter zoom range, um, they can produce a slightly better image quality. And since the Laua is a longer zoom range, um, that image quality suffers just a tad. the second time I dropped this ring. Maybe I don't need more coffee.
what is here? Is that FedEx? Hello, do close lenses. Hello, prismism. Hired. You can answer the phone. I think Brianna usually answers the phone. The, the standard response is do close lenses, how can I help you? Answer the phone, um, like for incoming calls. But uh, if it's a call for me, you know, I, they they page me and they say, "Matthew, you have a call line, whatever." And I usually answer, "This is Matthew. How can I help you?" And if nobody else is here and I pick up the phone, uh, it's not uncommon for me to forget that I'm answering the incoming call and just say, this is Matthew, how can I help you? Instead of do close lenses. So then they're like, wait, who did I call? It's a question I've been waiting to ask somebody who really knows about lenses. How perceivable is the micro contrast slash 3D rendition trade off from using a cine zoom versus prime? Um, that's kind of a loaded question because it completely changes from lens to lens and prime to, from zoom to zoom to prime to prime. Can have a piece of junk prime and the micro contrast is gonna suck um, and vice versa you can have a really high-end zoom and your micro micro contrast is gonna be fantastic so it's not that black and white it's not that a and b uh, and as far as the 3d rendition or rendering look or however you want to describe it um, that's going to depend entirely on the overall optical design of the lens. What is the pink purple liquid that you dip the screws in? That is thread locker, Loctite. But I'm not putting it on these because this lens is going to get a mount conversion to EF mount, uh, just not right now. So these are not being locked in place. I'm only putting them here to keep the mount on. Primarily so I could put the cap back on and protect the lens, since there is no mount conversion for this one. Luca here for my wife's MacBook. 
How's the weather in your wife's MacBook? Tizio Zoom versus Lawa, Tokina 16 to 28. Uh, well, so we went over that a minute ago, the Lawa Oom versus the Tizio. Uh, the, the summary of that is what you, the, the DZO zooms are going to be marginally better optically than the Lawa. Um, however, what you lose in image quality with the Oom, you make up for in zoom range, the sort of versatility. So it's kind of, it depends on what your goal is. If you're looking for something that's an all-in-one and you don't want to have to switch zooms in the middle of a, a take, or not in the middle of a take, but in the middle of a, a project, um, then yeah, go with the Lawa. If you're looking for something that's a little lighter, a little more compact, slightly better image quality, and you don't mind having to swap lenses, I would definitely recommend the DZO lenses. They're fantastic for the price. And then throwing the Tokina in there, that's tough to say because it's only one zoom. Uh, it's way shorter than the Oom. Um, it's a fine lens. Uh, the version 2, which you mentioned, is kind of heavy uh, for what it is. It's a little hard to justify that size and weight and price over something like a Canon L series 16 28. Um, so if you don't, if you don't mind the size and weight of that 16 to 28 version 2, then yeah, it's a fantastic option. But if you need the longer range, you're either going to have to go with the two DZOs or maybe throw in the Tokina 50 to 135 um, or just get the one Lawa. Unfortunately, there's no clear, definitive answer in that regard. Uh, there's not one clear winner. What's your current go-to lens on the Komodo? Good question. At the moment, it's this zoom, this MK Fujinon, um, primarily because I love it. I love the lens in general for Super 35 work. Um, but I am traditionally a primes guy, so I think I need to get the, the Zhang Yi what was it? What was it a 50? Oh, I know that was EF mount. I don't want that. I need a, a fast native RF mount. Um, prime lens. Like a 35 mil. I would love it if Zhang Yi took their 35 F 0.95 version 2 and made that native RF mount. Um, that would be fantastic. I started working on a conversion for that specific lens to L mount because I wanted to use it on the Sigma FP. Um, so it would not be difficult to swap that conversion to an RF mount if Song Yi isn't going to do that. So hopefully they do. Hopefully in fact, let's, uh, 
Let's take a field trip class. Try this lens too, 17 millimeter 0.95, uh, micro four thirds. So it's basically a, the mid or the um, Voigtlander. All right, products. See, this is their new one, but it's EF mount, so it's not going to be a good pairing on this. I don't want to mess with adapters. There's a version three of the 50, 25. There it is, 3514. Mount. Uh, so I use this lens all the time on my Fuji X Pro 2. It's a phenomenal lens. Um, actually, this looks like the version one. They don't specify. There's the Mark II right there in video highlight. Um, it doesn't say Mark II, but uh, anyways, I would love for them to make this in RF mount. Yeah, that's the version one. So yeah, if Son Yi made that in RF mount, that would be glued to my Komodo for sure. So maybe I will tackle that mount conversion. And don't get me wrong, it's it's not a very good lens mechanically or optically, but the images that it produces are fantastic. And it's so cheap, it's only 600 bucks. Come on, for a 0 0.95, $600. Alright, back to work. This guy is done, so. Last lens for the day. Is this is the 50, yeah, 50 F2. I had a 51.4 that I was going to do, um, but as I was setting up the stream, I realized that the focus skill was slipping all over the place. So that definitely needs to get some additional service before we do any modifications. Any bit of brassing on the mount. Not bad. Um, very little sign, signs, or very few signs of use. The engravings are fantastic. The paint is ever so slightly discolored. So 
So this should go well. The dot has been repainted. That's always weird that people repaint this dot all the time, but they just like, it's like they're using a paintbrush and they just blob it on there. It's not focusing that close. Like it's so sloppy, it's terrible. <laughs> I might take this Komodo, go to my daughter's ballet practice, get some some footage. Or maybe not. You're always It's challenging being a, a father of a, a ballerina. Anytime I have a camera or anything, it's you know, their parents are kind of hesitant. That's our society. Man, I've been talking to Caitlin at too close. I can't decide between the Laowa 25-100 and the DZO picture set. Maybe for my Komodo on small jobs. That's that's a tough one. Um, I'm gonna throw another curveball in there because we've been talking about it all morning, but I would definitely consider the Fuji MKs. That's the ideal solution, those two zooms. Um, but if you're looking for a, a more affordable option, mm, using a kipper tire, oh, so you need, uh, you're using PL or EF. So if, if it were up to me, if it were my choice, I would go with the DZO zooms. But if you're working on content that needs you to be more flexible and faster um, and not have to potentially deal with a mount or a, uh, a lens change, then I would recommend the Lawa. Uh, but I've been really happy with the DZO zooms. As long as that shorter zoom range isn't going to be a deal breaker for you. But if the zoom range is okay, then yeah, for me it's the DZO. But again, I keep going back and forth. It, it completely depends on what I'm shooting. Um, so for example, I was just talking about taking this Komodo to my daughter's ballet practice. So they do that in a park, and I know that I'm going to be, you know, 30, 40 feet away. So I may actually reach for uh, the Lawa because I have that extra range you know if they if i want to get close zoom in if i want to if they run up to me i can zoom way out um but if it's a situation where i know what i'm shooting you know it's scripted and i i'm aware of what the shots will be then yeah for me the dzo would be the better choice i know which which of the two zooms i will need for that scene um and i can pick it and Shoot with that. If you want to go nuts, go with the Canon 25 to 250. That is, I think if we weren't in the middle of a global pandemic, that lens would be the go-to zoom for a, a ton of productions. It's such a good lens. Matt, how do you like the top LCD on the Komodo? Are you using an EVF or external monitor for using the app? Um, the top LCD works fine for for general composition, but it's yeah, it's way too small for um, achieving or, or evaluating focus. 
So um, I use the app on a on my iPhone, which is pretty fantastic. You can go full screen. You can control everything. Uh, it's free. Uh, yeah. I do have a small HD, but it's HDMI only, and this is B and C. So. so this one is pretty concerning compared to the other ones. This grease has broken down and there's a ton of oil. Let's see if I can get it closer. See all this looks like drops and liquid. That's broken down grease. Um, either either poor quality grease that someone used, or maybe the lens was exposed to hot and cold temperatures fluctuating back and forth and deteriorated the grease. Um, but that's it. This lens will definitely benefit from getting new grease. Yeah, that's very liquidy. Given enough time, that that grease would definitely find its way onto the iris blades. Um, Michael, do you have a? You must have a stormtrooper body. So your your biggest decision is going to be: do you get the white lenses or the black lenses? should do a big shootout between DZO, the MK, the Lawa, maybe even throw in those Tokinas, the Sigma, oh man, the 18 to 35 is ideal on this camera. That's probably the only scenario where I would actually prefer the photo version of that lens over the cine version because the camera is so small and so light um, you really do benefit from having a smaller lighter lens DCI I'm recording internally, right? Uh, I don't see why not. I honestly haven't I haven't tinkered with external recording at all on Komodo. I don't even know what the output is, <laughs> the resolution.
the only outputs that uh, SDI, right? Yeah, just SDI. Does anybody make a, a breakout box for HDMI? I'm a very new, probably the newest Komodo owner because they shut down the Stormtrooper program. I shouldn't say shut down, they ended the Stormtrooper program. And uh, I had to pull some favors to get a Komodo because <laughs> I hadn't decided until the whole program was over. So Phil and I can bookend the Komodo beta program. Phil had the first one, and I have the last one. What serial number? can't tell you that. Like you're going to register it on under your name or something. <laughs> I don't know. Are they sequential? You tell me yours first. Two, six, eight. Uh. Oh, then this is earlier. It's, it's less than that. I won't say what the number is, but it's lower. It's in the twos, but it's lower than that. But that doesn't mean that... I mean, the, this particular camera could have just been sitting on a shelf. I've only... It's only been in my possession for three days. I had another Komodo that we were using as our test bed that had to go back to its owner. Um, which is why I hadn't made the decision to actually buy one. And then when I needed one, I had to pull some favors at Red. Seven four. Oh man. So I'm in like no man's land in the middle somewhere. Phil, are you still here? We need your input, Phil. is a good telephoto and wide angle lens match for Otis. Ooh, that's a tough one. Define telephoto, because that's that's challenging. I mean, some people would consider 200 telephoto. Ah, Phil is here. Yours must have been sitting on Jared's table. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> Um, Phil, the question is about the serial numbers. Are they sequential on Komodos? And is it, uh, and what number do you have? If you can share that. I don't know if you can. Over 150. Over 150, I mean, you could pair pretty much any... Uh... Actually, that's a tough one. Nobody's really making um, a 
affordable telephotos. I mean, you'd have to go to like a Canon 200 or maybe even a Nikkor 200. Um, but it's not going to be a great match mechanically. So for wide angle, you can easily match the Milvis 15 with the Otis and it's going to be seamless. Jim and Jerry is always reserved first few. I have number five. Wow. Yeah, so Antonio's number 274. I was saying that I'm below that, but not by much. I'm between 274 and 200, I'll say that. But does that imply that there's only 200 commode or 200-ish um, stormtrooper bodies? I think they're up to 600s. What? So, yeah, that's a good question then, Phil. Uh, are retailers getting Stormtrooper bodies? Because I think I saw somewhere that B&H was offering the Stormtrooper. That's really interesting. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, in our consultation duties with manufacturers, I've been asking for telephoto primes, fast telephoto primes for years, and nobody's really done it. Yeah, the last batch of Stormtrooper models went to retailers, according to you. Okay. Yeah, I think I had read somewhere that um, B&H had the, the white model listed, but they weren't using the word Stormtrooper, probably because they didn't want to get sued. The loop would be cool, but it's a touchscreen. That's my biggest issue with the FP. So the Sigma FP has just the screen, there's no viewfinder. And they make the, the viewfinder, which is essentially just a loop. And it's sort of hard mounted onto the body. And I love it. Yeah, it works really well as a loop and a viewfinder. But once you have that on there, you can't use the touch screen. So. I mean, it's basically the size and shape of an old Hasselblad or like a twin lens reflex camera. So I can see people wanting to have that sort of, um, that sort of action, that sort of operation. I love the FP1 form factor. There are many design hurdles for me to keep. Yeah, it, it's. It's definitely not the most practical camera. But there's no overheating issues. <laughs> That's, uh, I think, something that is not appreciated as much as it should be, given all of the Sony and Canon overheating issues and the fact that the Sigma FP has zero uh, heat management concerns. And it's fanless. Go figure. If Sigma could do it with a fanless body that small, there's absolutely no excuse for Canon and Sony. It's 
Sigma body is a hunk of metal. <laughs> it's light though. I mean, yeah, it's a little brick, but uh, it's not heavy at all. C70 has the same issue, no EVF. Oh, I didn't even think about it. No, but it has the monitor. So you could, and then you don't, I don't think that monitor is a touch screen. You know, you've got buttons everywhere. So you could put a loop on that monitor and not have to worry about it. I want to knock it out and reinvent Foveon. Uh, yeah, I mean, Foveon, they have to do something with it because they own Foveon. But I don't know, for, for motion picture stuff, I don't know that Foveon could even come close to what's out there right now. As far as, uh, I mean, specifically in the noise performance. Foveon is fantastic. I. I absolutely adore the color science out of a Foveon sensor, but the noise is just a killer. Some of my favorite shots of my daughters are from the Sigma SD Quattro H, which is a proper Foveon sensor, and the colors are just, the colors and just the overall image quality, it's so natural, so organic, um, it really gives that, I hate to say it because it's so overused, but it, it reminds me of proper film, like slide film. You know, like film. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Phil, but I also know the, the business of making cameras. Even if it does work well in low light and the picture quality is beautiful, it won't sell if every review says, yeah, but there's too much noise, or oh, it doesn't work in low light. And they can't make a camera that's not gonna sell. It just doesn't work that way. There's numbers. So they have to do something about the noise. <clears throat> At least reasonably controlled. Should email him. Tied to their patents. You're talking about patents for Foveon?
The problem with every source is the same Sony 6K sensor is there's nothing very special nor unique. I agree. But if they utilized Phobion technology, boom. Very unique. Now all I can think about is converting that Miticon to RF mount. I'm going to do it tonight. A hexagon pixel. You know, that's the only other manufacturer that is doing interesting stuff with sensor technology, in my opinion with their X-Trans pattern. And it has some five and six layer designs. Let's see if we can carry it. Hmm. Interesting. Problem with Canon is that they're not in a position to be taking risks. They're struggling. So I don't foresee them innovating at all in the next couple of years. Cringe Komodo Global Shutter is just scratching this room. Yeah, today should be a good day for some high dynamic range stuff in that park. Take 
six can do five years. Yeah, well, because they're a massive company, it's difficult to to steer a ship that big. If anybody can tell me what this music is from, I will give them a free piece of Duclos swag of choice. This song specifically, I mean, not this playlist. Bingo, Antonio. <laughs> purple thing for? What purple thing? Under construction. What, did you sound hound it, Phil? Um, if you guys want this music, Jerry Martin actually hosts it on his website. It's free to download. I forget what the website's called, like Boom Boom something. Boom Boom Pow, I can't remember. The purple liquid, this stuff? That's Threadlocker. In fact, my science experiment here appears to have worked. It did. Looks like it dried up again. It's gonna have to sit over the weekend. My daughters are enjoying Sims 4, which is funny to me because I played the original. swag, but I'm afraid to see how long it takes to get to you. That's the last one I have for today. A short one today. Cleanup time. 
I'm still blown away by the D-tap charging thing. I had no idea. Sixty nine hundred milliamp hours. That doesn't seem like a lot. Sixty nine hundred? through USB. Yeah, but I don't have a I don't have a, a USB mail to mail. <laughs> which is why I was saying I kind of wish it had a micro USB, which is so common. It's like the standard or even USB C. <clears throat> if it had a USB C that would be perfect. But 9600 Sorry, 6900 million. Is that right? Super small. I have power banks at home that are like 20,000, and this one's only 6,900. I agree, Phil. Everything should be USB C. Apple needs to get over themselves and start putting USB C on the iPhone. So why is this only 6,900 when it's the same size as my 30,000 milliamp hour? Oh, the volts, that's why. It's probably has a giant capacitor in here. Okay. Yeah, 14 volts, whereas a power bank's what, five at most? Or I'm thinking of amps, my bad. Five volts on most. Five to, uh, yeah, five volt. But still.
I'm just gonna let that sit all weekend. this little guy home with me now that I have batteries. Thank you for pointing that out. I don't remember if that was Phil or someone else, but whoever it was, thank you for that. <laughs> um, all right, I will uh, see you guys next Saturday.